And thank you, Logan and Chris. Um, this is part of our Q&A in quarantine. And this has been helping me stay a little, a little more sane or a little less insane, I guess, as this <laughs> goes on to kind of see some people and, and do some content and, and hear from people in comments. So as we roll through here, any questions anyone has at any time, just jump in. This is a, a Q&A thing. Um, so you guys are from Blue Sprocket Pressing. Mm -hmm. And I can tell Chris by the background, I've got a trained eye. You've got a uh, behind you, and I, I I doubt that's in the pressing plant. Um, no, no, this is uh this is over in the recording studio, which is actually how this whole thing got started numbers of years ago. Okay, um, so where are you guys located? And kind of walk me through how you guys, your whole company history, because it's I know it and it's fascinating. Sure, cool. Uh, so I, probably a handful of parallels in our story of getting going and kind of the 1979 thing, which is why I think, you know, we like working with you guys so much. Um, I um, am originally from this area, grew up in Harrisonburg, Virginia, uh, which is where we're located. Uh, we're on the western side of the state. Um, so if you're looking at that little, you know, waterfall of the state thing, um, we're over there on the upper left-ish side. Um, I had moved down to Nashville after high school, worked there for a while, bounced around town, um, and eventually floated back up this way kind of right before 2008. Um, and a rough economic time <laughs> and um, started, built a small studio um, and created a company called Blue Sprocket Sound. Um, to operate and file my taxes under. And after doing that for a while, uh, meeting my wife and realizing that we really liked Virginia, we were gonna stick around here. I started chatting with other guys in the area and saying like, what if we you know, make a real go at this? And we ended up building the recording studio in 2013. We've operated that ever since. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a, I think relatively nice studio. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Um, you know, uh, we're, we're pretty fortunate. We got a big Rupert Neve 9098 console, Pro Tools rig, plenty of good outboard, thousand foot or a thousand square foot live room with 18 mm -hmm. foot ceilings. I mean, it's a pretty killer drum room. Um, don't have a tape machine anymore because I gave it to you, <laughs> 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 which, I, I hope is making killer records somewhere right now. Man, it, I guarantee it's somebody's baby. Yeah. Yeah. I came and took a tour of your pressing plant and studio. I'm like, I'll buy that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, it, good because it didn't get used enough. Um, so yeah, then a uh, number of year, number of years ago, um, Logan, who had been working with me at the studio, um, and I were talking about, you know, kind of what the next phases are. Logan is a, I mean, we all love vinyl. Um, and we had a number of clients that their projects would go to vinyl eventually and would run into sort of the, the typical issues with lead times, or if they were doing smaller orders, they got thrown to the back of the line. Um, and, you know, with that was happening more and more and more as vinyl was coming back into prominence as a, as a release medium and the existing plants were getting overrun. Um, so we started looking into, you know, can we do this? We're all pretty technical guys. We like, like to build stuff, make stuff, fix stuff. Um, luckily, instead of trying to find some really, really old presses and rehab them, we, uh, hooked up with the guys up in Toronto at viral and, uh, you know, we're, we're running a warm tone press and started uh, started pressing records in Virginia in 2018. And here it is, 2020. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Um, so, and then Logan, uh, Chris kind of skipped on it for a minute, but how did you come into What's your background and how did you work into all this? Uh, I had uh, a similar background to Chris. I um, was in Nash Nashville for a little bit, went to Belmont and studied audio and business um, 
then came out of that and was trying to figure out what to do and, and uh, ended up back in Virginia um, and, and enjoying Harrisonburg and ended up working at the studio and and helping out there. And so I was around when we, we started having conversations about pressing and we kind of got really, uh, you know, really fascinated with the technology and I've been collecting for a long time, been really, you know, fascinated by the medium forever. And just started getting really immersed in, in how, how do these get made? Where do they start? Where do they end? And uh, just kind of kept going further and further down that rabbit hole. And uh, here we are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, talk to me a little bit, guys, about the transition from a vinyl record consumer and enthusiast <laughs> to a manufacturer. <laughs> I mean, um, it'd be like, hey, I like flying. I like taking trips, to, you know, on planes. Let's, let's build yeah. one and fly one, right? So, I, I'm going to say it's marginally safer than that, but. <laughs> <laughs> marginally. No, no, maybe not. Um, yeah, I, you know, I mean, luckily it's, it's not like we were foreign to the process, you know, uh, having worked in the industry on the production side, being a nerd, I, you know, would have had had the opportunity to go visit a pressing plant before mm -hmm. in my life. I'd sort of seen that, um, you know, I, I grew up with my father in commercial construction. So, you know, dirty commercial buildings is no big thing. Um, you know, I mean, a, a lot of it is, a lot of it is learning all the subtle nuances that go into, mm -hmm. you know, it, like you can explain to somebody the, the steps, you know, even like in the recording process, like, oh, well, first you, you track the music and then you mix the music and then you master the music and then you make a record and you can say that and somebody goes like, Oh yeah. Okay. It's like each one of those steps has a lot of little sort of idiosyncratic details. Um, so I think the big thing was knowing the broad strokes, knowing, learning what equipment we needed um, and then trying to pick the brains of as many smart people that had come before us and you know learn hey what's what's really important on the the, the boiler side the chiller side the you know um what's with different molds you know for different weights like how do you what's the how do you get a 140 gram record or 180 gram record you know yeah. and a lot of that research was just done over you know, a year and a half long period of picking people's brains as much as we could while we were doing, you know, projects for clients that were getting pressed in other plants. And Okay. So you kind of step in, like, you obviously are well-versed in, and we have to change our, our verbiage, right? I can't say making records, but recording, right. projects, recording projects. Yes. yes. So you understood that and then had been involved with... Mm -hmm um having vinyl records manufactured for you and your clients right, right. yeah so and had or right. outside and had, yeah had the the classic case of like hey this this all sounded great why does the last song on the first side get a little distorted you know as it gets closer into the label and like you mm -hmm. you the, these things pr crop up and and you you experience them but as you move more into, you know, becoming a manufacturer, you, you start to really understand why those things crop up. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I think we, we, we came into this from the recording side. So we've, we've got a pretty good base for what good sound should be. Now the trick is figuring out how and as we continue to make records, and I think we make pretty good ones, but always keep that sort of like, we want to make good quality records for our clients. So what are those little details in each step that allow us to make a better record tomorrow than the one we made today? Mm -hmm. And, you know, so on and so forth. Yeah, there was certainly a lot of, you know, there's a lot to learn <clears throat> going into it. And, and we, you know, I think we had a very applicable knowledge base to start out with. 
but there was still a big learning curve, lots of conversations to be had, lots to learn. And, and, you know, we're always continuing to try to keep learning, to try to keep, you know, finding that extra 1% that we can do better and better and better and try to make it you know, as the best product we can. Okay. So what was the point where you guys just said, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to, you know, start a pressing plant? Sure. <laughs> do you remember that moment or what, what was the, the straw that broke the camel's back as it were? Yeah, well, I guess, so we had been building, you know, we had, we did a lot of numbers in a spreadsheet in the beginning. It was, you know, let, let's, to the best of our ability, try and go out there and find just about everybody that we know that's good and how much they sell records for. Uh, let's figure yeah. out what, what stampers cost and what jackets cost and labels cost and, you know, like really break it down kind of almost as if we were just going to go into brokerage um, mm -hmm. and figure out what a machine would cost and all the ancillary equipment. And you know, we basically just did a financial business plan and took a look at, you know, how much business do we think we would get? And then we approached some people that we knew in different segments of, of industry, different manufacturing, different other types of businesses and said, hey, here's the numbers that we have. We have this sort of core competency experience in the music industry. And, you know, we're, we feel like we've talked to enough of the right people that we can make this work. Here are the numbers. Are we crazy? And enough people said, I don't think you're crazy that we said, okay, well, <clears throat> We're going to find out if we're crazy or not. Right. Yeah. And, well, and you guys, you know, lucked out too because your studio is only, what, 300 yards from your pressing plant? Yeah. Like yeah. It's, it's pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. Which is great. So, I mean, and I'm assuming that you're not, you don't do a lot of the one stop shop stuff where people record a project with you and press records. I mean, they're two separate clients and all that kind of stuff, right? They are. They're two separate businesses, but there there ends up being a lot of potential crossover. Yeah. Um, like we get plenty of stuff that comes in through the pressing side where, you know, a client will will ask me to, to do a once over on the audio, even if I don't actually make any sonic changes, just like a, hey, could you pull this up? I want mm -hmm. one more sanity check on this before we, you know, send it off to to have the lacquers cut. Yeah. Um, and we do have projects where people come to us and say, hey, look, what would be the price for us coming in? We're going to book the studio out for a week, two weeks. And, you know, the end result is either, you know, a seven inch or an LP or mm -hmm. you know, kind of whatever. And, you know, we're we're trying to streamline this process so that we don't have to be the ones managing every last little detail. And mm -hmm. in that case, they get the benefit of working with, you know, kind of a cohesive team. It, we're, we all work together. We all know each other really well. Um, I can do something over on the studio side and then pass it over to Logan. And it's very seamless. Yeah. yeah. And I, I would bet too, people looking at recording at the studio are thoroughly impressed that you have a pressing plan and what it helps them or gives them more mm -hmm. confidence in your recording studio too. Sure. Uh, oh, it, it, Dude, you know as well as I do, long studio day, you need to take a break. And sometimes it's just cool to be like, guys, let's, we're just going to walk out the door. We're going to walk 300 feet through this little field. <laughs> and uh, we're going to you know, go into this, this old 50s brick building that used to be a grocery store. And we're going to watch some plastic get smashed into a circle. <laughs> and uh, that, that in and of itself is worth the price of admission. There you go. <laughs> Cool. Well, I'm going to pop some pictures up and let's just talk a little bit about the technical aspect of yeah. getting a, a vinyl record pressed. You know, we, we, we heard some terms getting thrown around a minute ago, you know, like uh, a stamper, which is what one of my companies does is we make these stampers. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I took all these off your Facebook page. So if you like the photos, you're, you're, you have the credit. Um, so that stamper gets placed in, in this press and I've got like this, right? Boom, right? Boom. 
I'm moving my mouse around, but no one can see it. But on there is is a stamper, and uh, right, and then here's your spot. So mm -hmm. you got talking about your facility. It's like really cool black and white. So this, this, what are we looking at right here, guys? Logan. Uh, well, it's a viral warm tone press, as Chris mentioned earlier. Uh, viral tech in Canada. Uh, it's an automated record press, and uh, you, know, you can see all the lines coming off the top of the the press. There, the lines to our chiller and our boiler, which are um, you know big components in in the process, basically heating the the vinyl compound to to make it flow out into a good record and then cooling it to make it keep its shape uh, i don't know what uh what do you have to add chris yeah um so i mean I, I, the interesting thing about vinyl is you know the medium's what well over 100 years old at this point um and i guess the basic way that you make a record hasn't changed substantially um what we have gotten into is that these days we've got better computer control systems we've got better sensors for feedback and being able to analyze the process in real time and one of the things where where the viral press is is really cool um is that it's able to sort of self-monitor and and sort of react to its own process so that you know, you're getting the best cycle time, you're getting really consistent um, sort of quality of record coming off the other side um, from the, the quality in which it, it melts the plastic originally and extrudes it out. That's a very important process to, you know, in processing that plastic to make sure that you make a record with low surface noise, that you get a good flow across the the stamper that has the grooves and you actually get an impression that takes all of those grooves um you want, uh, you know, you want a really even you know you want every piece of the vinyl that's going into that press to be heated as evenly as possible so that the uh, you know you maintain the same fidelity the same you know, quality across the whole record yeah yeah so so that press is really fun to watch in the sense that i mean at its core, it's a 120, 140 ton hydraulic ram. Like, I mean, you can smash some stuff with that. Um, and and we're, we're using all that force to, you know, kind of create this, this record by just taking warm plastic and it, it seems almost delicate when it's closing and it's smashing the vinyl out and it's ex expanding out and you see a little bit of flash kick out over the edge, you know, to make sure that you've, you've filled the entire mold, but it's, it's like a huge amount of force. So it's, it's like crazy big, heavy industrial force in this very elegant sort of almost sexy computer controlled package. <laughs> Yeah, because this photo in the lower right, that that's fourteen inches across. Just about yes. thirteen maybe. Yep. And yeah. Yeah. And, and that mold is it, you know, think about what your car jack can do and that mm -hmm. ram is only, you know, two inches right. across. Right. And, and you're right, Chris, it, it looks very elegant and very peaceful. But yes. I was at a plant, uh, a pressing plant this last fall. And there was a a bolt had fallen out and had yep. gotten pressed into it, into the uh -huh. metal. And you could see and that thing was thread. flat. Yeah, and you could see each thread embedded into the mold. I'm like, holy shit. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you're you're looking at a hundred and you know I mean depending on the the size of the record, the weight of the record, I mean, there are a lot of times where pressures get varied, you know, and, and we are monkeying around with those certain one record might require a little more pressure to get to sound good than another. And, mm. you know, again, these are those little idiosyncrasies, but um, yeah, you figure like a 12 inch record somewhere between hundred and 120 tons of force, you know, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And has your appreciation of a vinyl record um, diminished or increased after you learn how they're made and make them yourself? 
Uh, both <laughs> simultaneously. Okay. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, I, I guess, like anything, when you when you when you get in and you learn more and more about a process that you've otherwise viewed from afar, I, I think most people develop that appreciation for everything that goes into it. But you know, you also as someone who makes them now you go back into your your own vinyl collection and you're looking at stuff and you're like wow i, I never noticed that how did that get out of quality control and <laughs> you get to be a little snobbish at the same time and then on the flip side of that you know you're making something and you're like hmm i could chase perfection or that that really is perfectly fine <laughs> it's a great sounding record yeah. yeah, it's a it's a great sounding record, you know, it's, yeah. and there's like a little bit of smudge off the, the label at the very edge, you know, it, it you end up looking at records a completely different way than you did before. Yeah, yeah. Okay. go ahead, Logan. Oh, I was going to say, I definitely, I definitely have a different appreciation after knowing, you know, really knowing everything that goes into it, all the, the little minutia. But then you also kind of get less precious with it when you handle these records all day and you, you know, right. they're getting tossed. You know, you're picking up a record and you're looking at I know the first couple of times that I picked up a record, it was like, well, this one has a, you know, a, the heat wasn't uh, staged properly, so there's a little bit of a burn on this. This has to go in the trash. Just taking a vinyl record, just pitching it to the side, it's like, oh, yeah, just throw it in the bin. Yeah, yeah. You don't know how to do that. Um, you know, you get, you get a lot more casual with handling stuff. And, how to handle it properly and, uh, you know, more quickly. Um, yeah, you, you start to notice those things in your collection as well, like little little things where you're like, oh, this is a perfect sounding record, and I can see this little thing that somebody, uh, you know, dealt with when they're pressing it. You know? Yeah, yeah, and I could, you know, a good example is right behind me, oh, let me go over there, is a stamper mm -hmm. that I had framed. This was years ago, I worked on a, on a Recording and and the rec and the recording got pressed and the you know they were kind enough to like send me this stamp because it was a cool record and I freaking framed it and now we make a thousand loads a, a month and I'm like right I, I would never frame one now are you kidding me <laughs> right right yeah well uh, we did the same thing you know the first the first black circle that came off of our press right. we framed and for what it's worth it's a bad record not that the music is bad it's just right. like it's like okay. The press runs, all the infrastructure is good, and it makes a black circle. Now let's make good black circles. <laughs> <laughs> so what kind of projects do you do you work on? What you know, you guys are are uh, how many people do you employ? Like how big is your company? I like to I like to talk about that and then like what who do you work with? So like how many people work and what what's your day to day kind of stuff or your roles? Yeah. Um, go. Oh, we basically <clears throat> there's basically four of us. Uh, we're a pretty small team. We've got um, you know Chris and we all kind of you know wear some different hats. Chris and myself um, handle you know, management, ordering, coordinating the projects. I kind of lean more towards project management, and Chris um, you know does a lot of work with the infrastructure and and uh, like sourcing materials and things like that. And, We've got uh, someone that runs the press day to day, and then we've got somebody who helps out with packaging. Uh, so we're pretty a pretty small team. A lot of our work is is regional. Uh, we do a lot of work in Virginia, um, and then you know in the surrounding states primarily. Um, and we work with a lot of <clears throat> a lot of different smaller labels and and artists, um, we're primarily in the kind of indie indie label indie artist uh, field bunch of you know work with you know, you do all kinds of stuff a lot of punk and hardcore music and then you know, a lot of what i guess i would broadly term indie rock mm -hmm. uh, okay yeah and then our our particular area we get americana which I, at this point i think is turning into like the new alternative in that it's just a it catches anything that has a mandolin or a banjo in it yeah, yeah. um you know by the end of the 90s alternative was everything that wasn't yeah. country right <laughs> um 
So uh, over on the studio side, um, and, and I, I keep a foot in each camp. So I'm, I'm probably in the pressing plant as often as I'm in the studio. Yeah. Um, and many days I'm in both, just walking back and forth. Uh, here over at the studio, we've got, um, we've got three formal employees and then, um, of which I'm one. And then we've got a, you know, a handful of freelance engineers, producers that also work out of here. So also a smallish team. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, I, in a lot of ways that helps us kind of keep that family feel, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, so between the two companies, well, six to eight people, okay. something like that. I mean, definitely small business. Um, and then we pull people in when we need them for, for projects, if we need to, to scale up or whatever. And every now and again, I'll get a call that's like, Hey dude, I know you're working on mastering something, but is there any way you can come over and help us leave some records? And I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you guys have, um, one record press is that right yeah um we've got yeah so we called her loretta the the idea was we would pick names of people mentioned in beatles songs with no very uh the, it's a basic framework for naming presses <laughs> who knows where we're gonna go from there um when we set up the plant, the infrastructure is designed to be able to pretty easily pipe in about six presses. Okay. Um, so the plan is to, when we can't put any more production on that press without really monkeying things up, put another one in, another one in, and we can actually, we can pretty much hot pipe in a press. So without shutting that one down in any way we can bring another one in have electrical steam water all run to it and then fire it up get it going so it, there was a lot of there was a lot of thought put into that piece of it which is how do we get started mm -hmm. and then how do we set ourselves up to if we're fortunate enough to be able to grow to do it as seamlessly as we can that's smart that's smart and then what you know what kind of projects or what, what's your niche in this, you know, because obviously with one press, you know, you're not, you're not, you know, doing. Yeah, we don't do a lot of 10,000 yeah. and up unit orders. Um, yeah. You know, Logan can speak to that, but I mean, we'll, we'll do an order as small as a hundred units. Okay. The unit cost isn't great, um, <laughs> but it, you know, it, it serves a, a niche and a, and a community of, of artists that otherwise, you know, they, they want their stuff on vinyl. They want a good quality product. And, you know, with, with their particular mix, a hundred units to get started works. So, yeah, yeah. you know, we, we make them aware that they're spending a lot for a stamper that can press a thousand copies and it doesn't matter. They're going to pay that same price, whether they press, one or a thousand units but you know we're happy to do it and then we're happy to put the the stampers on a shelf and hold it and then hopefully they come back to us in six months and say actually those hundred just vanished and yeah. now i want to do you know 300 400 whatever yeah um but yeah i mean we can technically that machine once you got stampers on it as long as you keep vinyl in the hopper it'll keep going so i mean there's really no maximum other than just time in the day yeah Sure. So, okay, Logan, let's see. Yeah, so what, what kind of projects do you like? And what, I mean, obviously you guys are in bands with bands all the time, so I'm sure you're working with a lot of independent uh, regional bands, right? So we're talking about your perfect kind of project and what, what, how a good project flows, you know? Uh, well, you know, it, it, it's hard to pin down exactly what the, the perfect project is, you know? It varies. I would say, as the uh, as a production manager, the perfect project is thousands of black records because you can just get the stampers going. You can just roll. You know, you just keep them keep them coming off. And you know, every time you have to do a changeover, whether it's a color changeover, record changeover, uh, maybe a different label. You know, sometimes we've had records where it's split release between different labels, or we're pressing you know a 
version for the U.S. and a version that's going overseas. Yeah. Occasionally, stuff like that comes up. So there's two or three different labels, center labels, that is, mm -hmm. um, that have to go on for corresponding record labels. You know, um, on the one hand, it's great when we can um, just put a record on and roll all day. Um, I always encourage, you know, and as with any kind of manufacturing, the more you press, you know, because we're doing less changeovers and stuff like that, the, the cheaper the records get. Yeah. Or the cost of the stamper, the print setup, all of that gets spread out over the road. So I always encourage people to, to order as many as, as makes sense for their project. And, you know, but we also recognize that that's different for every project. It might be 100 records for one band that's just going to be playing in town once a month. Um, it might be 1,000 for a band that's you know, got a lot of traction, is traveling around a lot. Um, and then, you know, on the the vinyl fan side of it, I, I do really love the crazy color combinations and, mm -hmm. you know, some of the marbles and, and cool things like that that we can do. Those are, those are always exciting to watch come off the press, you know, they do take more time, but they're fun. Okay. Yeah. And to talk a little bit about price per unit, you know, just for people watching and, and I hope this is a good resource for artists looking into this process. Um, you know, the, there are fixed costs, like this stamper, for instance, and the, and the lacquer master that helps make this stamper costs the same whether you make one record off of this or 10000 you know? So that that fixed cost of $600 or so mm -hmm. has to get divided into the number of records you pressed off of it. You know what I mean? Let alone the jackets, which cost, you know, I mean, we've all ordered stuff, you know, it's all the mm -hmm. same. It's like if you order 10, here's the price. You order 15, it's not 50% more. It's usually 20% more. You know what I mean? So it's the same thing. And, and, you know, I'm sure you guys, you know, know what a dollar is and how hard it is to come by. So when you're talking with fans, you can kind of walk them through, maybe order more mm -hmm. jackets right now for less price. That's 100 or 200 records. When you get a reorder, you've already got the jackets, you know, those, those kind of comments. Right. Yeah. And, and some of that, you know, we have a, we don't have an unlimited amount of space to, to store stuff, but, you know, we, you know, we, we've got certain clients that we know are, are regular repeat clients, some of our indie labels, you know, and, and we'll do exactly that where they'll say, Hey, we're going to do this record. We don't, know for sure how it's going to sell but we're going to go ahead and order you know we think there's a good chance it'll you know it'll do well so we're going to end up doing a repress of it on a different color or something so yeah. let's just go ahead and order the jackets so we'll go ahead and store them uh so that we've so that when that inevitably happens you know we're not reordering it we're not paying for print setup again you know you don't have to go through all those make readies you know we've got the stampers um you know, we know you guys do a really good job of holding on to mothers and we always, you know, do two step at least as as far as making the, the, the lacquer and the stamper and, mm -hmm. you know, so that we've got the ability to order more stampers um, for, for those reasons. Keep good count of how many records get pressed on a stamper so we know, you know, how many times we can do a repress before we got to get more and, you know. We, we help keep track of a lot of that kind of stuff for our for our clients. And then for projects where somebody says, look, I really only think I'm gonna make a hundred of these. And I just, I really want to make a hundred of them. You know, we've gone out and tried to find packaging options where we can, you know, order closer to a hundred jackets instead of ordering 500 jackets and throwing 380 of them away yeah. um, or recycling. Yeah. Uh, so try to be proactive there as well, um, because we do know that we are predominantly serving that that smaller independent artist niche. Um, so try to try to offer as many options as we can. Yeah, we do we do whatever we can to try to make that process as seamless for you know, the, the artist or label at whatever whatever level they're at, whether that's you know somebody who's going to be selling 500 records and coming back a few times for another 500. And, you know, we try to store as much stuff as we can so that, that is you know, smooth when somebody's ready to come back and get some more or you know, trying to keep things, to keep the waste low 
for people that know they just want to do one little short run. It's a limited thing. And maybe it's just a, you know, sort of a passion project or a little hobby project. They just kind of want to make it to have it. You know, there's, there's a whole lot of different uh, levels and we try to do what we can to, to meet everybody's needs as well as we're able to. Well, it sounds to me like if a band were to call you, you they don't have to explain to you what their concerns are and what the resources are because you know, right? <laughs> Probably. And, yeah. And and you can offer them some creative solutions or have their best interest in mind, right? That's yeah. what I'm getting when I hear you guys talk about this stuff. Yeah, yeah. that's, you know, I, I think like, like almost anything that, that I've ever been a part of, it's you know, what, what has gone right and gone wrong in projects that I've been involved in and how can I make sure that when we get a client in, we can make sure that their project goes right and we're able to, to help guide them along the, okay, so here are the things that could be an issue. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? You know, you say you want to do this, but you also tell us like, hey, I, my budget is this. So may, maybe that's not totally possible, but hey, this is really cool and would give you basically the same effect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, you know, just trying to leverage the experience that we've gained and that people have been kind enough to share with us and help people, whether they're doing a big project or a small project, have a, an in good result. Yep. Yeah, and one thing, like, is I talk to a lot of bands, you know, I own a recording studio as well, and, mm -hmm. and that's kind of where I live. And one of the things I really try to get across when looking into vinyl manufacturing is to kind of keep, you know, keep your same sentiments and your values as you go through the process, right? You carefully chose your guitar or your drum kit, and you kind of, you probably know who made your guitar pedals, right? And right. Obviously, you know who mixed the record, you know who mastered the record. Don't suddenly just Google vinyl record pressing and then and then get a quote and send it off because even though it may look like it's pressed in the US, it may not be pressed in the US. Sure. Even dealing with a large company, you know, a lot of the people I work with, musicians and bands and artists and such, you know, they they shop local, they you know, and they spend money that way. Mm -hmm. And 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 sometimes there's a disconnect on vinyl record pressing. And I, I tend to steer them towards smaller companies like you guys, and you can call those and talk to Chris. They know who you are and you're supporting them. Because I'm gonna guess you guys also play instruments and the people you hire are musicians and mm -hmm. or in the industry and all that kind of stuff, just like my companies, you know? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and that's a that goes a long way, you know. Sure. But, you know, in my mind anyway. Sure. Yeah. Well, I I have always appreciated working with companies where I can pick up the phone and I can call and get a human being and talk through something, you yep. know, and, and that, I mean, that becomes especially helpful if something goes horribly wrong, but sometimes it's even just nice, you know, as you're, you know, you're, you're working through the, the process and you just have one little question. You've got one little idea, just being able to reach out and say like, Hey, what about this? And have somebody just answer you back, um, you know, instead of, and, and, you know, in our particular case, our company is small enough that, you know, sometimes somebody calls in to Logan and says, Hey, what about this? And, you know, if Logan doesn't immediately have the answer, he can quite literally walk over to Tavin, who's on the press and say, hey, somebody's, they, they kind of want to do this color blend. They want to do this, you know, is there anything that they're looking to do seem like it could be problematic? Because, um, right. I mean, Tavin's on that press every single day. I mean, that those two, I think they're becoming like symbiotic <laughs> organisms <laughs> at this point. And, you know, so th there's there's a benefit to, to that sort of fast reaction. You know, it's not a, oh, I have this question. Okay, well, let me call the guys over in the Czech Republic and see if that's going to be a problem or not, or wait until the test presses arrive from across the sea to find out if it was an issue. Yeah. 
these are all very big hypotheticals. But right. Yeah, I think part of one of the benefits to the the size of our team is that we're all mostly in the same room all day together. Um, and so we do have a pretty direct line of communication and we're able to troubleshoot, problem solve, you know, make adjustments and, and work you know, in that way pretty quickly and effectively. Um, if somebody calls in, you know, there's, there's lots of benefits to working with all kinds of different sizes of companies and, and um, you know, different, everybody serves their own role but I think one of the things that we offer is that we are a very small company. So when you call in, you're not talking to somebody who's, you know, multiple people removed from the press itself. I'm typically, you know, sitting at a, at a table 10 feet away from it and I can you know, hop up and, and engage with that very, very quickly and make sure that we're you know, doing what we can to fix any problems, make the best record that we can. Right, right. You know, because again, it's like, you know, the, the artists I work with anyway talk with great pride about who is involved with their recording and mixing and mastering and, and I always champion keep that momentum going, keep that thought process going to, you know, like I go to South by Southwest and, and the big conferences that are here in Nashville and a couple of years ago I just stepped out to get some fresh air at a venue here in Nashville during I think Americana Fest or something and there was a band trying to start their band. So I just went over and helped them jumpstart the van with my truck or something. Got to talking to them and we had mastered the record. <laughs> right. Yeah. It was yeah. as organic as it gets, you know. Yeah. And, and that's fun. And 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 then now we have a even stronger connection. You know what I mean? So sure. um, it, it was hilarious to see them, you know, throw it up on Instagram because you know, dirty hands like this is the guy that you know <laughs> whatever you know. Yeah. You know, and and those things can happen. You know. Uh, mm -hmm. Let alone the support that we all give our own communities. You know what I mean? So, right. um, well, how how would someone get started on the process? And give you know, since we've got you guys here, why don't we give some some tips and tricks to to artists looking at it? Because it vinyl can be you know complex to get started, but it also can be very easy, right? So, sure. You, since you're the customer facing, right? Is that correct? Would you give us some some kind of some tips and tricks to get started on the process and what what artists should have ready to go and when they should start stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, I think one big thing is to not be afraid to ask questions. There's, you know, there's a lot of, on one hand, it's a very simple process. On the other hand, it's, it feels complicated sometimes and there's a lot of different aspects to it, whether it's, you know, all the different pieces of artwork way that they need to be set up or the music and how that needs to be set up. Uh, one big thing I think is that um, you know, a lot of times people leave artwork till the very, very, very last and they end up behind the ball and they end up, you know, a couple weeks late because they sent their artwork in a week after they should have and something's not right with it. Yep. We're going back to them and saying like, oh, you know, the sizing is, it's, Everything looks good. The layout's good, but like the sizing and formatting is a little bit off. We need this to change, or the, the color formatting needs this this adjustment to print properly. Um, you know, as much as you can be trying to work on that kind of stuff when you're getting the mastering done or beforehand, you know, the better. Um, I think that's one thing that we run into a lot is that that ends up being sort of the last thing that people start thinking about um, the more that you can uh, the more that you can be prepared on that front the better um, and you know doing your research with laying out the artwork and making sure that it's done done properly you can you go a long way mm -hmm. got you yeah. yeah, I mean, I've I've had conversations with people on the production side. It's like, hey, I know we're tracking this record, but do we have any idea like what order these songs might eventually fall in? You know, even before we go into the mixing phase, let alone the mastering phase. And uh, typically, that's because of like when I've worked with artists, typically I've worked on most of the process, um, or or am connected to the project in a long enough arc that just sort of thinking about the end product, even at the beginning, yeah. starts to inform decisions as you're moving on, like picking 
guitar tones and like, hey, are we making an arc on this record? You know, are we, you know, you know, what what are we trying to do with this thing? Mm -hmm. Are we making a mixtape? Are we making an album? You know, so on and so forth. Um, but having trying to think about the artwork from the very beginning. And, and I know sometimes the artistic vision really informs that and you don't, you know, as the project is coming along, more of that becomes clearer, but there's, there's definitely issue when you're, you're trying to get this thing, you, because by the time you get to the end of the project, you know, you're trying to get into the manufacturing phase, inevitably you took longer doing tracking and overdubs than you thought. You did more revisions of the mixes than you yeah. thought you were going to. Yeah. Um, you know, somebody at the very last second, even after the first pass of mastering said, I really think we should flip the, the track ordering around a little bit. So, you know, inevitably by the time you're at manufacturing, unless you were just a boss with scheduling, um, you've already used up all your spare time. Yeah. So, and like print has lead times, you know, I mean, I can order jackets tomorrow, but I'm not going to see them for two weeks. That's mm -hmm. just the way it is. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and that's, that's assuming that there isn't, you know, a global pandemic or something going on at the time yeah. that may or may not, you know, monkey with lead times, um, you know, standard lead times for submitting music and getting lacquers cut and stampers made so that we can do test presses is, is you know, 10 days. And even then that's 10 days from the time that we order it and you guys do your incredible work with it, but then we've got to get it into our queue to do the test presses. So, you know, that's trying to, trying to make sure you've got all your ducks in a row of audio print um, and, you know, knowing whether or not you want it shrink wrapped or put into a poly bag. You know, we have some people that like to defer that decision and that's probably not a good idea. Um, so we try and walk people through checklists. You know, Logan's really good about, you know, putting those ducks in a row with people and making sure that, you know, from the time we've got assets, which is your music, your print, you know, if you're giving us download codes or whatever. I mean, once we've got everything that we need and end up deposit, you know, we can pretty comfortably say like, okay, this is about how long it's going to take for us to put these records in your hand. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's important to get a good head start on this too. Like I, I tell the fans I'm working with, like when I start mixing, it's like, look, start your artwork, start emailing, get this figured out. Cause you, you don't have anything to do right now in this. I know you're always right. busy, but, as far as the album goes, you're on flaws right now while other work mm -hmm. is done. Start running down this other road, you know, yeah. because you want to have the time, you know, like we do your vinyl mastering. I, I tell our team, it's like, if you hear something that could be better, reach back to the plant, reach back to Blue Sprocket, they can talk to the client, and let's mm -hmm. take the time now, let's take that data to maybe the software right. is different or something doesn't quite jive or mm -hmm. this could be presented better. And I want, I want to make sure we take the time to do that now. You know, much like in the studio, you don't want to rush through any part of the studio if you can avoid it, you know, so. Yeah, cool. and, you know, and we've had clients reach out to us when they're starting to track a record and mm -hmm. say like, hey, we're, you know, we're recording this album and we know we're going to put it out on digital CD and vinyl. Um, what are your lead times? What do we need to have to you when? And having those conversations early, I think is is great um, because it, it lets us know, I mean, it lets Logan kind of have a sense of like, okay, well, this project's probably coming in around this time and, you know, maybe it gets delayed by a month, who knows, but, you know, we have some sense. Uh, so, so we can be thinking about that and we're happy to answer questions along the way. Yeah. It's uh, it's never too early to reach out and ask about pressing, yeah, leading or cutting or mapping. You know, it's, you're never too early to be having that conversation. Yeah, and that's a huge thing. Yeah. So then, what do you recommend for um, release parties, like album release, and when to start that? Should they should they have a release date set and then call you, or <laughs> oh man. Uh, it, 
it always varies. I think if I think if you're willing to you know, really give yourself a lot of extra cushion, it's still probably smart to have a record in your hand before you are booking that stuff. But you know, for a lot of our clients too, they're um, you know they're looking to be able to shorten the gap between when they make their deposit and when they start to be able to recoup that cost. Yeah, sure. Totally, you know, totally yeah. makes sense. You know, they're trying to look at the lead time and go like, okay, well, this is the the soonest reasonable release I can I can do. So let's we'll try to hit that. And and people, you know, as vinyls come back and it's grown, people <clears throat> understand the intricacies and understand the way delays work more and more. And, you know, we'll still have people that don't get it and that will be frustrated. But you know, there's there's always going to be projects that take longer than you think they will. You know, I would say it's, if you can wait till you have the record to, in your hand to book your release show, then then that's always the best thing to do. But if but if you can't, then you know, just try to give yourself as much time as you possibly can. Yeah. Yeah, and if nothing else, just, you know, again, as far as that, it's never too never too early in the process to call to call the pressing plant, you know, I mean, you can reach out to us and the more time that you give us to be in communication with you, the better we can even help try and inform. Like if you call us up and say, Hey, we would like to put this record out in, you know, we want to put this record out in August. Okay, cool. Like, do you have a date in August you're looking to shoot for? Okay, cool. Give us that. We can start backing it up because we have some sense of, how busy we think we're going to be around that time. And, you know, we can, we know what our typical lead times are with our suppliers. Um, you know, it, it's a completely different animal if somebody needs to make a small run of black records because we keep plenty of black compound around. And, you know, if it's just a black record and a white paper sleeve, you know, like if, if it's a completely run of the mill job, then there's there's very little that would, you know, short of there being a you know UPS managing to take a stamper and bend it in half, uh, which does not happen all that often. But you know, barring some just completely unforeseen freak thing, there wouldn't be a lot that is going to. But if you, you know, if you've got a really wild specialty color component to your record or whatnot, some of those compounds we might be able to get in a week. It might take us a month, you know? So some of those things where if we know what your vision is, we can be talking with you and trying to plan to make sure that, you know, we're, we're there to help you meet that. Right, and Logan, I'm sure, is, is looking out for the artist passengers too. And if they, he's having a conversation and, and they're like, well, we're, we're remixing a couple of songs right now. He'd be like, well, how about the artwork? Is the track is the track order? Let's get the thing going. We could have jackets sitting here in our uh, facility waiting for records to get put in them. That would save you time, right? So, you know, you can help nudge them and, and be their, you know, be their, I don't know, spirit guide through all of this. <laughs> Ooh, I like that. Logan, I'm having your business cards remade. It's Logan Stoltz was final spirit guide. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, you know, I you know I talk bands through recording process because you mentioned that earlier on, Chris. It's it's a lot like that. There are these broad terms we use: tracking, order, mixing, mastering, that all have their own rabbit holes. And this has the same mm -hmm. thing about the mastering stampers. You know, yeah. blah blah blah. You know, it may seem foreign, but then um, you get walked through the process. Um, well, I had another question, and I it already escaped me. Damn. Um, mm -hmm. Well, um, man, what was I going to say? Oh, well. Um, so, small runs, big runs, colors, everything like that. There's this cool gold color here. Uh, I'm trying to think of any pictures I didn't put up there. Here's a bunch of records. Cooling. Um, oh, yeah. So, let's talk about, you know, a lot, a lot of times, too, artists get a little wound up, and rightfully so, when they get their chest pressing or something, and something isn't quite right. Um, and this kind of goes back to the, the literally the pressures involved with making a record, right? It was a pop or a tick or something like that, and and they, and you guys, your solution would be like another round of test pressings or something like that. You know, let's talk about that as not a big failure or some sort of poor workmanship, 
right? And it's also kind of feathers into the time frame thing. It's like allow some time to for this is kind of part of the process, right? It's not a minute failure and all things are fucked and all that, right? Right. Yeah, and I mean sometimes and and also this tends to happen more when a client like this is the first time they're releasing to vinyl and they've never done that process um like sometimes they'll you know they'll they'll get their test presses they take the very first one out they pull it out they put it on their turntable and like there's immediately just some some static pops and things and it's like you know you're you're getting a record that has you know, we've listened to it at, at, you know, we, we do multiple rounds of quality control, especially on the, on the test presses, but also on the production runs. I mean, in, in our facility, there is a turntable literally right behind the operator. So even yeah. as the run is going, we're like pulling off yeah. and throwing headphones on and listening. Yeah. Plus, yeah. And, you know, plus then full batches, we go and, you know, random spot check records as we go through that as well. But, you you know they might get a couple of pops and it's one of those like all right so and they hear a couple of pops and we immediately get an email that's like i don't know there's a lot of noise it's really bad and it was like okay calm down did do you own an anesthetic brush did you try cleaning it off because sometimes that first time that record gets played you know there's a little bit of something from the sleeve that just got into the groove and mm -hmm. you know it's the first time you're playing it that needle had to go drive that thing right out of the groove you know um not necessarily listening on a turntable that's calibrated or set up properly uh, a lot of people are listening on turntables where maybe they don't you know they don't actually have tone arm weight control um and the thing's sitting a little off kilter and you know so i mean sometimes there are some issues that we end up helping diagnose uh saying like hey okay cool so you heard something with that test pressing throw another record on there. Is there the same problem? No. Right. Okay. Well, if there's not the same problem across three or four records. It's probably not a common thing. So now do you have a buddy who's got a nice hi-fi setup? Can you go over to their house and listen to it? You know, things like that and try and just um, help people through that. But yeah, sometimes we'll, you know, something happens, you know, they're, it, and it might be the kind of thing where there is a pop that we missed. We're human. We try not to, but may, maybe we do. And it shows up on their end. We'll pull out the, the test presses that we keep as our reference copies. We'll listen to it. If we hear it at that point, you know, they say like on the third song, on the A side, at this exact word on this syllable, I hear this. And we go, okay, we hear it. We're like, yeah, okay, cool. We can go back to you guys. You guys have been great about, you know, pulling a mother and listening to it. You know, did it did it happen in the pressing process? Did it happen in the plating process? Did it happen in the cutting process? You know, we can work backwards and we can figure out exactly where the issue, if it is really an issue, happened and get it corrected. And then that does take some time. But yeah, at that point, we get it fixed. New test presses, get them out. And as soon as everybody's like, ooh, that's awesome. Boom. Yeah, and, and to your point, you know, and I've, you know, we talked about a mother, so we find a metal master and, and put it under a microscope because we need to see literally microscopic grooves. And that big, loud pop in your speakers is a little speck of dust that, that occupies one fourth of the groove, seriously. Right. And, exactly. And all on the phone trying to find it. You know what I mean? And and yeah, yeah. And that's the level of care that goes into this. You know, and yeah. it's interesting. So yeah, yeah. Which is uh, the the coolest thing about vinyl record manufacturing is that you know it's there's an aspect of it that is completely just bohemian and and just you know smashing plastic with huge tons of force and you know we're talking about grooves that are fraction of human hairs you know at, at the bottom of the groove and you know we're it it's it it's really really cool that and and almost magical some days when you think about the whole process and you go like wow this even works 
and still works really well today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, we like to keep these at about an hour when we're there. So I just want to thank you guys for your time. And this has oh, been you. a lot of a lot, a lot of fun and a lot of good information too, you know. So um, once again, if you're looking at doing some vinyl, how do they get a, look, a hold of you guys? Uh, we you can go to loosebracketpressing.com. We've got a quote form there, or if you wanted to send us an email at info at loosebracketpressing.com, we'll uh, get right back to you. We're always happy, cool. and happy to talk through things and help however we can. Yeah. yeah, and I would I would encourage bands to do that. Um, you know, shop local, stay in the U.S., and that, that's just to support your like-minded people. You know, and sure. quote, and they can talk talk you through. And I'm sure if they've gotten quotes from other places, other brokers, or whatever, you could kind of help them look at what they're looking at because it's not always apples to apples. You can kind of talk to them about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. cool. Well, awesome. Well, thanks, guys. Yeah, 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 and check out bluesprocketpressing.com, right? Yeah, thanks for thanks having me. You're welcome. Absolutely. All right. Cool. Later, man. And...